All right. Hey, welcome to the first ever Raging Chicken Press podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, we're going to be starting out this little podcast to get a little sense of uh, what's happening around the state, especially in our state capital in Harrisburg, uh, in large part because uh, we have our little Raging Chicken Press outpost over there. I'm sure that anybody who listens to, uh, I'm sorry, anybody who uh, reads our stuff on Raging Chicken Press is familiar with Sean Kitchen. Uh, Sean Kitchen will be reporting uh, from Harrisburg today. Uh, he's joining us now live uh, to talk a little bit about what's happened around Harrisburg. Hey, Sean, welcome, man. Thank you. It's great having this uh, podcast. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll we'll keep this going to give people perspective about, you know, what's it like uh, daily in the state capital, what's happening uh, in terms of legislation policy, um, and get a little behind the scenes picture about um, how things actually work out there in ha Harrisburg. You know, what's everyone likes to talk about uh, the sausage, right? Sausage is like uh, or legislation is like sausage making. So maybe we can get a little bit of that sausage making background, but also a little bit about what life is like in our, you know, in our state capital. You've been out there for about a year now, right? I have. It's been really fun. Um, you know, the place has been growing on me. You move out here, you're like, oh, I'm going to Harrisburg, the dregs of society. And now it's like I've been out here for a year and it's actually been pretty fun. You know, over the past few months, I've been able to make some gains politically, uh, building relationships with people representatives, state senators, and it's actually become a lot more enjoyable on that end. But also, I'm getting used to the area uh, with the re stuff you can do recreationally in Harrisburg uh, and outside the area, hiking, biking, the running trails, or the uh, like the bike trails along the river and stuff like that. So it's been pretty fun. Um, I'm actually starting to love this place. Awesome. That's great to hear. So let's get right into it. Uh, give us a little sense of kind of what's going on on the ground right now there in Harrisburg. Uh, any major issues that are happening in the Capitol or just happening in the Capitol? I know you've written about a couple things uh, that have just taken place, but why don't you walk us through it? What are some of the issues you want to talk about today? Okay. So since um, last month, the governor gave his budget address, right? Second week of February, because it wasn't the first week because it was on Groundhog's Day. So you cannot mess up Groundhog's Day in Pennsylvania. That, that's like a... It's kind of like messing up the Super Bowl. You mess up so, the seasons. I mean, nobody wants to mess up summer. Yeah, no one wants to do that. So what happened was the three weeks following governor's budget address, uh, the session, legislators are out of session, but there are legislators in Harrisburg. The Senate and House Appropriations Committees are doing their hearings. They talk to all the directors of the state agencies, and then they kind of formulate their opinions on what this year's budget should be. Mm -hmm. And also there's a lot of grandstanding going on too with that stuff. And um, one of the issues that happened lately, well, there were a couple of them. Uh, there was State Senator Alloway, who spoke in front of the Pashi uh, Board of Governor, Frank right, Brogan. Give us, give us a little breakdown here. So tell us a little about the Senator Alloway, and then, like, what is Pashi? Give us the background for people who may not be familiar with it. So uh, Senator Alloway is a total meathead <laughs> who sits on the Senate Appropriations Committee, which, in my opinion, that committee is just a complete joke. Meathead is the uh, scientific word for it, I guess. <laughs> uh, jock or whatever, but the, the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, I think, is a total, uh, is a total joke. 26 members of this, of the, it's a 26 member committee. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 52% of the Senate. All the other committees are 11 to 12 people at most. So it mm -hmm. kind of gives a lot of people to get their say in. And um, one of the things he did was he was talking to the uh, chancellor. Right. Yes. The chancellor of uh, the state system of higher education, which is the 14 universities. Uh, he took time to go after the unions and he called at the hearing. He called a professor, an old dinosaur, an old dinosaur. This is a professor who was there testifying. No, this was a professor. He had a meeting with at Shippensburg University and he was railing on the union, how the union's blocking apps. Your, or your union uh, mm -hmm. is blocking plans to do pay for credit and blocking a lot of other things in the upcoming contract negotiations. And this professor interrupted him and told him that he was wrong and he didn't know what he was talking about. And so, he so this is, so this is one of the guys who uh, wants to shift all the state system of higher education universities over to the paper credit model, right? Which, which we know now, which would raise tuition by anywhere between 15 and 25% on students. Um, it's, it's kind of one of these sleight of hand, tactics that uh, the kind of right wing, especially are very fond of as a way of further privatizing our state system of higher education. Do I have that right? 
Yes, and this guy is a board of governor member. Um, he sits on the board as one of the legislators, uh, well, Senator Alloway. Oh, it makes sense that someone like that who respects faculty so much would be sitting on the board of governors. So yeah, it calls him a uh, that calls him a dinosaur. Calls dinosaur. an older professor a dinosaur. He goes after his attack tenure uh, and attacks the the union. Uh, another thing that actually happened uh, about like an hour or two hours before that hearing was uh, our friend Senator Eichelberger. He was speaking at the Dep Department of General Services. And what they do is they ho they're the people that give out the press passes, the security badges, and they also maintain the buildings. All right. right. Give us a give us that sense again. Who is this? Who is Eichelberger? Where is he from? Eichelberger is uh actually you listen to Rick Smith's show, right? Yes. He is uh in the fart cloud that Rick is talk always talking about. That's his senator. Mm -hmm. uh, goes from Carlisle over to Altoona. Mm -hmm. Um it's about a two hour wide district, right, to travel out to Altoona. And Eichelberger um, had problems with union teachers over the summer who were following him or just badgering him while he was going out for his daily runs in the morning. You know, he's an avid runner. and There were teachers get up there giving him the finger. You know, people of the public didn't really like what he's doing, and they're, they're, they're telling him what, he, what they think. So he took time to uh, complain that the journalists in the newsroom aren't paying enough money to uh, use their space. He, so he this, wants, is his, this is his latest thing. So first there's the conspiracy that he doesn't like uh, people not treating him nicely after he's cut their benefits and wants to go after and wants to gut public education. And now uh, his latest thing is that the journalists uh, are not paying their fair share. You know, the First Amendment journalists. Do I got that right? Right. And what happens in the what happens in the city? Well, what happens in the capital is that, you know, the journalists have their own dedicated space, the newsroom. Right. Which to get in the newsroom upstairs in that hallway that Senator Hughes was talking about, you have to be a PLC, a Pennsylvania Legislative Correspondents Association member. These are people from the AP, Patriot News, uh, even so a couple independent media people up there like Roxbury, um, <clears throat> you know, WITF. Everyone like your established news outlets are in this are in this confined space. Okay, the space is pretty dimlit. Not the best uh, facilities around. You know, I'm like, you know, talking about shrimp and lobster and caviar and all the kind of stuff hanging out in there. No, they're, they're, they they might have like one refrigerator in the whole building, the whole area serving like twenty people. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thinks that they should be paying market share for their thing, for their value. And what happens is, the Department of General Services they actually pay for that. Oh, we got a phone call. No, it's all right. <laughs> the the journalists actually pay for their um, pay for their space. They don't pay at market price, but they pay for their space. And mm -hmm. the senator wants them to pay for market, pay for their market share. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was also took time to complain about it gets too loud when people exercise their First Amendment rights inside the rotunda, which can be it can get pretty loud in there. I, I feel for him sometimes. Yeah, you know, democracy is inconvenient for people who don't like democracy. So. Yeah, uh, well, I find it guy. interesting, you know, I when you first told me about that story about Eichelberger wanting journalists uh, to pay more money to pay uh, quote, quote unquote fair market share for uh, for having some media space in the Capitol. I was I, I kind of found it remarkable even that they had to pay anything. You know, I mean, after all, we're talking about, uh, you know, the fourth estate. I mean, this is uh, First Amendment protected rights. Uh, journalists, in my mind, should have access um, to uh, senators and to the process of what's happening at the Capitol all the time. Uh, but, you know, it, it was something that, you know, they're already uh, paying something for the space. And as you described it, a, a fairly dismal space. I mean, it's not like lap of luxury, people hanging out on leather couches, laughing and drinking champagne. We're talking about a space that actually journalists can, you know, get their equipment together, kind of write up some stories and have some um, space while they're in the Capitol for downtime, if, if I get right. Right. And it, what I, th I, you know, I, I don't mind it to pay something to be in there, okay? Mm -hmm. But they're getting it at a subsidized rate. And um, one of the things I actually told, I shot this off to a couple people in an email chain that I screwed up. I did a, uh, I included all my contacts in the same, uh, in the same, you know, subject line. And, um, you know, it's sparked off an email chain. And one of the people who got back to me was saying, this is actually absolute bullshit because mm -hmm. we do this every year. We, it, it, this, this happens every year. And a couple of the people who are in that did not realize that, like people from um, local, like, some local advocacy groups were in there and they did not realize that um, this is actually a, a fight 
or a battle that comes up every two years. So this people. you're talking about, just to be clear, so you're talking about when you're saying this, you mean the the call for the media to pay more money? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the pay more money. It's like a year. It's like Groundhog's Day. It happens every year in the Capitol. <laughs> the, you know, legislators get their rocks off by you know demanding the media pay for their space, and they don't. And so this is just getting so, shut down. So this is like a big waste of time and a way for this, uh, you know basically the right wing, to get the right wing folks, the right wing folks basically to get you know, as you said, kind of get their rocks off and uh, get some talking points in and make themselves feel good before they move on. Right. That that's basically what it is. It's incredible that you know this is this is what people are going to spend their time on. Um, but so you know, I want to talk. I want to make sure we got enough time here to talk a little bit about the story uh, that you covered just yesterday. I mean, a fairly major event in uh, Harrisburg in terms of the minimum wage. Why don't you talk us through that? Right. So um, it was a symbolic gesture. The governor Wolf uh, he signed a uh, executive order raising the minimum wage for all state workers to ten fifteen an hour. Mm -hmm. So not many. It only affects four hundred and fifty people right now. Um, the total cost is one point six million, and then the, the extra cost for state contractors will be factored in as contracts expire, and then they are renewed with the Commonwealth. And so um, we're not talking about the minimum wage of the entire state of Pennsylvania, we're really talking about just a kind of a subset of workers um, that the governor has kind of direct authority over. Is, is right. right. And these, these, these people are janitors, custodials, they're maintenance workers. There's some of these people are going to be part-time workers and it makes their lives better. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a gesture by the governor. And my parents were up here yesterday and actually brought them into the press conference and they were trying to ask me like, well, why is this important? So it's a symbolic gesture, right? It's political theater, what the governor did. And what, why is it political theater? Well, you know, the unions were in there the supporting what the governor did, hooting and hollering, because they've been fighting this battle for over a year now. And these bills have been sitting in committee for over a year now with people who do not want to raise the minimum wage. So the minimum wage is supported by like 72% of all people, all residents of the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. Democratic or Republican, right? And then... 61 business owners support raising the minimum wage in the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so you think if that many people are supporting it, raising the minimum wage would be good for your constituents, right? Right. Don't you think so? You're Republican. 50% yeah. Republicans support raising the wage. You think you'd be helping out your constituents by that. But no, that's not who their constituents are. Their constituents are a stone's throw away from the Capitol. Well, I thought this was, I thought it was an interesting move on the part of the governor too, as well, because I do think it's, I don't, I would say that it's not something that's just political theater, but it actually gets, uh, you know, gives people a sense of what's possible, right? It generates uh, headlines and it gets stories in the newspapers and it puts the ball in the Republicans' court. You know, we have a right. do nothing legislature right now and they don't want to raise the wage. They don't want to move on this. This puts pressure on them to do that now. Right. And, and this is, this is the kind of thing where any, you know, any attempt to move to move a policy forward, it's always more difficult to get rid of it, right, than it is to actually um, build on it. Just so the same kind of, you know, argument that we hear all about Obamacare and all that kind of stuff, you know, that was one of the concerns on the kind of the right wing is that they were so vehemently opposed to it because they knew that when once people kind of got those benefits, you know, um, pulling them back away from them is really difficult. And I also think it's like, you know, it's telling in an era that we keep on hearing that government, the government can't do anything, that government is, you know, um, just backwards, it's not helping out people. When government is actually does something affirmatively that actually helps people out, um, then people's minds start changing, right? They start thinking like, oh, well, maybe this is not unrealistic. Maybe a $10 or maybe a $15 minimum wage um, is not unrealistic. And that mm -hmm. seems to set a certain kind of groundwork. And the minimum wage is like one of those issues that has bipartisan support whenever it is put on a ballot measure across the country. If you're in a red state or blue state, the minimum wage increases always pass in those states. It's something, it's a universal, it's a universal idea that's supported along party, both parties, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're helping out your fellow citizens, you're helping out your family, you're helping out your anyone in the area, right? Of that people who might be affected. So it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a very, I'm trying to think of a word here, very uh, altruistic idea. Like, you know what I mean? It's altruistic. Yeah, yeah, sure. At its finest. And All right, so so no. the, 
so, so we, we, we got about we got about a, a kind of a, a little bit more of a, than a minute before we got to go to break. So uh, my understanding too, as well, from what you wrote about, was that the uh, kind of Republicans lost their minds over this. So yes, talk, they did. Tell, tell us a little so, bit about that. So I asked the governor. I love this. I asked the governor, do the benefits outweigh the cost? Right. It's just a simple mm-hmm. question. I'm not asking like a four dimensional chess question here. It's benefits no, outweigh pretty, the cost. No, pretty pretty straightforward question, right? Yeah. And he said, of course it does, because it lowers it raises morale, lowers costs on the business owners. And it gives people more money to spend in the economy. Well, the Republicans were saying, well, it's going to cause more of the budget deficit. Well, it's $1.6 million out of $30.2 billion or $29.7 billion, whatever number you want to use, right? Mm-hmm. Which comes out to 99, 9 thousandths of a percent, mm-hmm. right? You round that up, that's one hundredth of a percent of the actual budget. And they're throwing a fit over this. Why? Because it puts the ball in their court. And it kind of gets rid of their talking points. You know, the people, who, they, who do they represent? Do they represent their constituents or do they represent the lobbyists and the business associations going against this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's why they're freaking out over this. That's great. So were there any of the, who were the lead voices on that? Oh, your usual uh, band of uh, idiots, Seth Grove, um, Stephen Bloom, were, were the two leading the charge. You know, these are the de facto uh, Freedom Caucus spokespeople we have now in our own. In, in our in our legislature, yeah, you know, one of the things I was thinking about um, that, that was going to be useful for us to do, I think, on Raging Chicken Press is, you know, to get a list of get a list of those Freedom Caucus people, right, so that we all know who we're talking about. Because you know, what's interesting is that once you get outside of Harrisburg and once you get outside kind of your specific district or something, you know, most people, I think, in this in the Commonwealth, most people in Pennsylvania are not familiar with um, these people and these characters. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that I think that that we need to do is name the names and put names to faces to let the people know that these are the people that are actually causing these problems, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of think of, I, I think about these people as the ongoing presidential election, right? I just want to make my last point before we go to break. Yeah, no, go ahead. You know how like there's the freelancing going on in the Republican caucus. The party has no control over everyone. So you have Mitt Romney freelancing on his own, going after Donald Trump. You have all these people freelancing on their own, supporter Cruz, Trump going against those two. Yeah, I, th- I find it I find it awful. I mean, I mean, awesome. <laughs> I'm enjoying yeah, it fully. It's like reality this, TV. This, what, this is what Seth Grove is doing. He's freelancing on his own because the caucus does not have control of their members. They're letting people who've been in office for three years to go out and just tank the budget, tank these bills, and to like be de facto spokespeople, the self-anointed ones. The, these but, are who these people are. They're self-anointed spokespeople. True, who, but you know what? I have to say this. It's like I'm not actually I'm not opposed to people going freelancing. I I have look, you want to freelance, you want to kind of like break away from your party, that's fine. I have no issue with that whatsoever. And I think that, you know, I don't care how crazy nut job those people are, have at it. You want to say what you're gonna say, that's great. What what gets me, however, is that the weakness of the leadership, right? The weakness of the leadership is saying that they're being allowing themselves, right, to be held hostage by those individuals because they don't want to rub them the wrong way. That's what gets me. It's like so, I put more more on the the actual party apparatus than on those individuals who want to go off and you know spout off their nonsense because you know that frankly that's what you get in a democracy, right? Is that people are going to say what they're going to say, but at some point you have to have a party that is uh, you know is going to basically say, what do we stand for? And are, is this who we're going to get behind? And the disaster that we're seeing in the Republican Party through all these debates right now, I mean, this is, this is unbelievable, has everything to do with the fact that the official establishment of the GOP side, that basically they kowtowed to those people for so long because they knew or they thought they knew that they had either had control over them or they were going to be able to use them to win elections. And now they've gotten so far down that road that they can't get back out without destroying their party. So, you know, I see the same thing happening in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's a good assessment. It's an extremely fair assessment. All right. Well, cool. Well, listen, we're going to take a little bit of a break um, and we're going to be right back with Sean Kitchen. And we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, so a little of the kind of non-political side of a kind of out in Harrisburg, just going on a little bit behind the scenes. And uh, we'll take it from there. We'll be right back with Raging Chicken Press podcast with Sean Kitchen. 
All right, we're back here with Raging Chicken Press Podcast. I'm I'm talking with Sean Kitchen. Uh, Sean Kitchen, as you all know, is our assistant editor at Raging Chicken Press, and he is uh, the occupier of our Harrisburg outpost, reporting on the goings-on inside the Capitol and in the city of Harrisburg. So in the first part, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the things that are happening on the floor with uh, the minimum wage. Uh, one of the things, Sean, before we get to the, the kind of non-political stuff that's going on in Harrisburg or some of the kind of fun stuff, uh, um, maybe you can give us a little bit of preview of some things that you, you see that are kind of coming up um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, well, the Senate returns, both legislation, both chambers return next week. And one of the big issues that are going to come up is medical marijuana. Um, it's been promised a vote on March 14th, which is this upcoming Monday. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll see if it actually happens. You know, it's been like the PA budget. Eh, we'll, we'll vote on it next week. It'll be done in two weeks. It'll be done in three weeks. It'll be done two months from now. Right. Uh, the same thing we've been hearing throughout this budget stalemate. We're hearing what medical marijuana. It was supposed to be done in the summer. It was supposed to be done in, you know, in December. It was supposed to be done in January. Now they're saying it should be done next week. Uh, it's time to wait and see. Uh, one of the things I learned out here in the past year, when people say something should be done, don't bank on it. It gets done when it actually gets done. Oh, good. So we got medical marijuana coming up. Anything else? Um, no, I think that's about it right now. That's the big legislative issue uh, coming up. All right. Awesome. So uh, we'll look for that for the ne next week and we'll touch base with you next week about that. Absolutely for sure. So, uh, you know, I understand that you uh, you had some visitors uh, out there in Harrisburg yesterday. Uh, kind of tell us a little bit about what you did. Yes, it was family day on the hill yesterday with um, <laughs> my parents came up and they wanted to take a tour of the Capitol. So we went up to the Capitol. My parents are both in almost 60. My dad's 63. My, mom, my mom's getting up there. And uh, as soon as we walked up the steps, all I heard was, Jesus Christ, we got to walk up these stairs <laughs> in the building. And I knew from there it was going to be a long day, but it was actually really fun. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, we So when we got in the Capitol, we went up to the front desk. The lady's like, well, the next tour is going to happen in about 20 minutes, but there's going to be a group of school children. You're free to walk around yourself. So, so, so did you, uh, have they been up to the Capitol before? No, this was their first time ever in the building. Nice. So uh, we decided, I decided to give them my own tour of the Capitol. You know, I showed them the different caucus rooms where the, um, where the hearings happen, you know, where the sausage making is going, where the committee meetings are at. I showed them a couple of the buildings that are, you know, the house is always open. The people's house, the house chamber is always open. Those rooms are always open to the public. You can walk in, you could point out what's happening in them. And then, um, you know, I took time to show them a couple of the paintings uh, in the different buildings connected on the complex. You know, if you go into the Ryan office building, there's the state library there. Mm -hmm. And when you go up this beautiful building, uh, like all limestone, mm -hmm. you go inside of it, right? You go up and you're walking up these stairs, you see this huge painting with a, a 10 foot statue of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And the painting inside the library is a battle scene from Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. With Lincoln, uh, with the with, with his Gettysburg address right there on the bus on the like on the the foot of the uh, the statue. Wow! So we went in there. As we were coming back, um, you know, a state senator who I sling a few beers back every couple of weeks with uh, asked me, "You want to go on the Senate floor?" No, nice. so, like, so you didn't plan this at all. This just kind of happened on the fly. This yeah, this this happened on the fly. <laughs> uh, this, this kind of happened on the fly and he's like, you want to sling some, you know, I sling some beers back with him every couple of weeks. He's a, he's an extremely conservative Democrat, right? The Republicans in the Philadelphia area are probably more liberal than he is. Mm -hmm. So he's like a blue dog, you know, he's your typical blue dog. And, right. um, he's like, I'll take you on the Senate floor. He's like, I like it. Let's go on the Senate floor. Tell your parents to come with me. My parents like, should we do it? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah, are you kidding me? Come on, when are you yeah. gonna get this chance again? Right. You will never be able to go on this floor. The Senate floor is rarely over, rarely opened up to the public. It's pure political geekdom for me. It's like walking into, like the Sistine Chapel almost. You know, you you never get that that opportunity because of how closed the chamber and how secretive the chamber is. Yeah. And um, so he showed us the Senate floor. He um told us about the paintings on the inside. There, this lady, uh, Violet Oakley. She was 25 years old, one of the first women to ever receive a grant to uh, do a public mural project. Hmm. Um, she painted the walls of the Senate. All the like all the Senate walls are her work. Yes, all the artwork in the Senate wall in the Senate, the House, and the governor's man, the governor's office were done by this lady. It took her 30 years of her life to do it, and um, it was just it was amazing getting to see these paintings in this like closed, empty chamber all by herself. 
it's it, it was it was amazing Man, um, i like i like the way you described that as political geek them and stuff too as well because you know i i, I don't know i mean it, with all the cynicism that we get about government i mean one of the things that's i you know every time that you and i talk about uh what's going you know being out in harrisburg and so on um you know a lot of people seem to have lost that 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 kind of sense of awe like and that sense of history you know um, and when you first told me about this Violet Oakley too, when we were kind of talking before, before the podcast today, um, I was like, wow, this is, that's so cool. Right. These, every little artifact in that it's building. It's one of those things you never get to, you never like hear about with the, with the cat within the Capitol. Right. Um, on a different suit, you know, I was mm -hmm. talking to one of the AP reporters. I introduced him to my family and along the house side of the, on the floor of the house. You know, hallway going to the House floor, you know, on the mm -hmm. bottom floor of the caucus yeah. room is the majority leader in the House Speaker's offices are. You have paintings of all the House Speakers. One of the paintings, he said his favorite was Ben Franklin because mm -hmm. he was only in there for like a few months before he got voted out of that, voted out as House Speaker mm -hmm. in the 1760s. I told him one of my favorite paintings was this guy called uh, K. Leroy Irvis, who was mm -hmm. Pennsylvania's only black um, House Speaker, one of the only black House Speakers since Reconstruction to ever serve in any chamber in the country. Uh, he was in there in the 70s and 80s. And um, you look into his history, he was fighting desegregation policies in Pittsburgh long before the civil rights movement took off in the 1960s. That's amazing. You know, I, I remember when you first told me about this guy and it's like, wow, you know, this is, that's incredible, right? Here's, you got this painting and here's this history of this guy. And, you know, a lot of people forget about, um, you know, the interesting politics, racial politics right in, out in Pittsburgh too, as well, is that you had some really interesting movements, um, a kind of African-American kind of organized labor, um, cultural scene out there in Pittsburgh and so on. So it was kind of interesting, you know, it, it kind of made sense after a while when you're saying that's where this guy came from. Right. And then, um, so there was that, I explained that to Mark Scarfalo from the AP. That was my favorite painting. And, um, when we went, so going back into the Senate, right, you walk through the Senate, uh, the rules, off the rules, off the floor rules committee room, right, which is like right literally off the floor of the Senate. It's like this little room, round table where all the rules committee members sit to do their work, to bring bills up and stuff like that. And then when you go inside the Senate chamber, you have a paintings that are in a chronological order of the state's history. When the Quakers made peace with the Indians, you had the founding of Pennsylvania, the charter being signed. Then on the one side, you, then you had the signing of the Declaration of Independence with Ben Franklin sitting on the chair next to the rostrum. And then you had a few other paintings and they're absolutely spectacular. And, um, you know, so we after we're getting this spiel about Violet Oakley, um, the center is like, do you want to sit on the chair? The chair? The, the, this chair uh, on the rostrum. And I was like, I can't do that. Come on now. <laughs> He's like, no, do it. It's like the only time. So he picks up the mace. So tell us, wait, 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 wait. So, so tell us what this chair, what is this chair? It's just a chair next to the rostrum the, underneath the, the painting of Ben Franklin. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's one of the symbolic chairs. I forget the background of it. So he's like, sit down, you know, have a seat on the chair. And I'm like, okay. So I, he's like, I think he's like, he hands me a mace. A mace. A mace. <laughs> And he's like, now, now you and your family are going to get a picture of everyone holding the mace sitting in this chair. Oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm like sitting down and I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. I got a huge smile on my face. Like, here I am taking a picture of myself on the Senate floor holding a mace, a friggin' <laughs> mace. <laughs> so, I, so I was sending that photo out to some of my friends. Just call me your supreme leader. <laughs> you know, I'm the next Donald Trump, like doing that type of stuff, uh, make, make, making some off color jokes. Mm -hmm. And I showed that picture to some of the uh, folks in the media, and they're like, they're, they were laughing. Uh, <laughs> Roxbury made a funny joke saying, Yeah, people won't believe you. They'll think you're sitting at Burger King or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. With the man. You should have had one of those uh, cardboard crowns on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And we that's got to awesome. see. We, we got to see all the seats of the senators, right? They're, they're introduced by the gentleman from Cambria County, the gentleman or the missus or the lady from this county or that county. And um, it was actually really fun. You know, I had, I had the chance. Yeah. I got to ask, I got to ask, did you, did, did you go over and uh, kind of like pull up a seat and sit in Scott Wagner's <laughs> seat? Did you go over well, you and know, maybe carve a little something in the, in the top? 
<laughs> well, you know what happens in the Senate stays in the Senate, so I really can't say. <laughs> uh, maybe he'll find a nice little prize underneath the desk. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No comment. Uh, excellent. All right, man. Well, that's awesome that your parents came out, um, and uh, I'm sure then, they had well, an awesome time. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I know. And then afterwards, you know, I, so like throughout that process, you know, they came out. I was introducing them to all the media members I know, yeah. some of the senators and representatives I know, and. Um, you know, we were actually offered to go tour the house with a house member that that that, that I know. I'm I'm pretty good. Uh, I have a close connection with, but we had to move our car because of the parking situation in Harrisburg. So we got to our car just as they were about to start ticketing people for uh, not having parking permits in my neighborhood. But um, I brought my parents into the governor's press conference. They didn't know what was going on. They thought it was pretty interesting now like being able to do that. And they heard me ask a question to the governor, mm -hmm. which I completely messed up. <laughs> you know, I asked him did the cost outweigh the benefits and he kind of looked at me like I had three heads on my shoulder. And I was like, Oh God, I can't believe I did this with my parents here. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it real. <laughs> yeah. I was like, just don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. And I messed it up. <laughs> so, so I'm curious then. So then after all this kind of what was their takeaway of kind of the day in the Capitol. I mean, it must have been awesome to see their kid, you know, out there um, in Harrisburg walking around and being able to get some of this this kind of access to some, you know, like the Senate chamber and so on. Um, what, what was their takeaway from it? Um, their legs were hurting. Well, their legs were hurting. <laughs> from all the stairs they had to climb. Because, uh, you know, these, these, these stairs, these, uh, this building yeah. would not be able to be built today. You know, yeah. it is so out of code. Some of these steps are like walking up ski slopes. No, no. You, know, you take a header down one of these stairs, you're not. You're you're going right to the hospital. Oh, that's funny. It reminds me of the time uh, I took my folks uh, to New York. I used to spend a lot of time in New York and uh, uh, the city, and uh, I wanted to show them the village. Right? They had never been to the village. They had kind of gone down with my aunt and uncle before, and they've seen some shows and stuff. But it was basically way uptown in Manhattan, and uh, I wanted to show them the village because that's kind of the area that I knew. Um, and of course I was, you know, walking, we're walking through Chinatown, we're walking through the east side, took them to Alphabet City, we got all over the village and I'm just going, 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 did you see this? Did you see this? Here's the tenement houses. This is what happened here. This is what happened here. Um, and it was a freezing cold day in the wind. And I got, we got kind of like halfway through Chinatown on our way back to where, uh, where we were parked. And, uh, I looked back at them and realized like, oh, I'm the one that was having all the time. They're like <laughs> sitting there, like their legs are hurting. They're cold. They're barely being able to keep up. It was kind of funny. Yeah, so. but it was an awesome day. It was a great experience. Um, you know, I got, instead of like, you know, there's a couple, like I got to show them like some of the back hallways too, right? In the Capitol, if you've never been in there. The fifth, the 500 level floor is literally like the second level of the Capitol on both wings of the Capitol. So if you go up to uh, the fifth floor, right? which there's a hallway you can walk across the fifth floor, go around the rotunda mm -hmm. and you can go from the house to the Senate without anyone ever seeing you. Okay. So if, you know, like say if the speaker wants to make a private visit to the, uh, the majority leader or the Senate president, he can just go up the elevator, go all the way up and over. So people don't see him walking down the hallway through the rotunda into uh, the, the Senate chambers. So there's like a hallway where like we're navigating up there, and my my, my dad's like, "What are you taking us? Like, what is this?" I'm like, "This is like one. This is like the back rooms of the Capitol that leaders utilize to not be seen walking from chamber to chamber, which is uh, like one of those like odd, oddities you see in the Capitol." Yeah, sure. So it's kind of what you know where where the actual architecture was built for the back room deal. So. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we got to get, uh, we're going to coming up to uh, another break here. And uh, we're, when we come back, we're going to talk to Sean a little bit of just, just about the everyday nightlife, things that are going on, uh, maybe some cool places to hang out, uh, maybe his favorite beer. I don't know. We'll see what we got to get, get to. I'm um, just going to life in times in Harrisburg right after the break. This is Kevin Mahoney, for the Raging Chicken Press podcast. We'll be back in a minute. All right, welcome back. This is the Raging Chicken Press podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, and today we're talking to Sean Kitchen. Sean Kitchen is out there in Harrisburg, uh, and uh, we've talked a little bit about his awesome, you know, tour of the Capitol. He brought his family out there. Uh, we heard a little bit about the minimum wage legislation and stuff. Uh, in this last segment, we just want to kind of uh, get a little sense of kind of like the nightlife out there. Some cool things going on. Places you hang out. Uh, favorite beers, favorite, you know, whatever you want, Sean. It's like, you know, give us a little sense of what's happening. So one of the things I love doing when, especially like there's a session day, right? My off days from work are Mondays, Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that gives me time to be in the Capitol during session days because the sessions are usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And when that's happening, uh, three day week, that's always good. Yeah. <laughs> well, they do. They're in their office the other days of the week, supposedly. But yeah. um, when there is a session going on, you know, I usually go to like um, or a Monday night or a Tuesday night, depending on who's in the office. I'll go to uh, one of my favorite bars is this Irish pub called McGrath's, which mm-hmm. is uh, down near the Capitol on uh, Second Street, all right off the of Second Street near the uh, Federal Building, right? And uh, usually, yeah, they know that place. I was there actually a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you can go up there and you can go right into the McGrath's, and um, there's a downstairs area, which you get to, which fills up with lobbyists, just a bunch of wh- white men in suits, <laughs> and then you go upstairs. There's more white men in suits, which is in the smoking section. And inside the smoking section, I usually meet up with uh, Roxbury, mm-hmm. who uh, runs Roxbury News. He um, is one of the people I've been following for the past year, shadowing him, mm-hmm. because he's really the only other independent media source up here. And um, sometimes there's a fundraiser going on with uh, Democratic senators, and uh, sometimes I get to meet, I get to drink with a couple of the senators up there. So what do you do? You just crash it? You just kind of walk up there? I'm like, hey, I'm here for the fundraiser. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I'll go up there and the one guy's like, no, you can come in and have a couple of drinks with us. I mean, usually like there's no one up there. I, I let them have their space, but he's, you know, the rule is everything up here is always off the record. Mm-hmm. But so we have, we have some lively conversations. Uh, one of the senators I drink with on, a, on occasion is uh, this guy from um, J- Johnstown and Altoona. Mm-hmm. And um, what he gets to do is uh, you know, he, he, he's an interesting guy. He rolls his own tobacco cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Here you have this guy in his sixties rolling his own pouch tobacco, a member of the Senate, and he knows how to put. He knows how to party. He, he, uh, and he has some interesting. He gives us interesting uh, insights on the, what's happening in the Capitol on a daily basis. Well, it's cool. I, I remember you, you always talk about kind of uh, conversations you overhear in the coffee houses and people, you know, discussions you get, t- you know, you, you get into with people, kind of just you know, having a drink with or something like that. That actually gives you a lot of background of kind of what actually makes Harrisburg tick. Yeah, it's actually really funny because I I keep a low profile. Um, you know, like a lot of the lobbyists don't know who I am. So I here here I am walking into uh, McGrath's. You know, I'll, I'm in my jeans and a shirt all day. So I'll go back to my apartment, throw on a pair of sweatpants and a hoodie, and then just go walk right over to uh, McGrath's. And I'm, I stick out like a sore thumb, and they still don't know who I am. And some of the shit I hear them say is absolutely a, a horrendous. So wait, 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 wait. So let, let me get this right. So you're like dress up clothes are jeans and a t-shirt <laughs> so uh, jeans and a, but- and a button down a button down okay <laughs> but when I, my bar clothes are sweatpants and a hoodie oh my god man you're like george costanza <laughs> <laughs> can't stand you can't stand you <laughs> and um so here, one of the you know things i heard a couple you ever seen that episode of seinfeld no i haven't you know what? You're gonna have to go back to do some old school Seinfeld research. You look at George Costanza. Like George Costanza started wearing sweat sweatpants every day because he basically said he just gave up. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, that's the image that you're projecting to the world. Represent millennials, man. Represent. <laughs> yeah, so I go in there, I'm sitting down. There's these people from the chamber, right? This is like one yeah. of the stories. Happened right after we had this blizzard. You know, 30 inches of snow just got dumped on us. Yeah. You know. It was absolutely horrendous. I couldn't get move my car for like a week. Yeah, Pennsylvania does so well with snow, anyways. <laughs> yeah, and roads. And but, roads. but uh, so they were talking about Governor Wolf hiring the state meteorologist, right? Yeah. And how it's some like communist ploy to, uh, <laughs> to or conspiracy to spout out lies about climate change. And these are people from the chamber, like the it's Chamber incredible. of Commerce lobbyists and stuff like this. And um, these are the insiders that, and so like, I'm just listening to this. I'm posting this stuff up on Facebook, mm-hmm. like as this is happening, live time, live tweeting these conversations as I'm at the bar. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that, that example though too as well, because you know, it's always, I think for a lot of people when you're, they're kind of listening to politicians spout, you know, this kind of nonsense, you know, this communist plot to kind of, I don't know, indoctrinate Shove people. Down our right, right. Exactly. That stuff. You know, I think for a lot of people, they don't know like how much of this is just showmanship and how much of this stuff is things that they actually believe. And what's remarkable is when you hear, you know, lobbyists from the chamber or, you know, wherever, these folks that have got lots of money that are kind of, you know, spending tons of time and money trying to influence our politicians to hear them be just talking like together, having a beer, drinking, 
drinking coffee and hear them that actually believe this nonsense. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, uh, that we should be really concerned about because these people are, are just off their rockers when it comes to that. Yeah, and, like, this is the type of place. So, like, the story goes on saying the governor hired the meteorologist, so in a couple of years' time, the meteorologist will come out and start saying that climate change is real, and they're like, well, this is absolute bullshit. I really was at the point, I had a couple of beers in me, <laughs> and I really just wanted to put my glass down and turn around like, yo, jackass, there's a difference here between meteorologist and climatologist. Learn the facts. But I didn't. I kept my mouth shut. I was biting my tongue. And I'm just putting this stuff up on Twitter the whole entire time. It's like, I, I, yeah, if you go through my Facebook feed, you could see me posting this stuff up in live time. Oh, man, that's that awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, and I think that uh, I uh, this is for anybody who's actually going to listen to this podcast down the road and because it digs back into this one as our as our first in the archives. Uh, if you want a good drinking game to play alongside this podcast, uh, you know, just for fun, uh, this this would be my uh, my suggestion. And as every time Sean says. I had a couple beers in me. <laughs> you got to do a shot <laughs> because number one is that a good story is about to follow from that, <laughs> right? And often a lot of those good stories, the off the record stories, the things that uh, you know are happening out there in Harrisburg are often preceded by Sean saying, "You know, I had a couple beers in me." <laughs> and at the same place, right? I was with the senator, um, and he's just railing against environmentalists. You know, I'm out there drinking Roxbury, and this guy's just railing against environmentalists, and I'm like, "Oh, mm -hmm. Jesus." You know, this, that, and the other. I can't go into specifics of the story because it's all off the record. Yeah, yeah. But he's like, you know, these goddamn environmentalists, hippies, this, that, and the other. I'm just laughing the whole time. This is like a five minute, 10 minute rant going on. And he turns around, and looks at me like, what were you laughing at? And I'm like, excuse me, Mr. Senator. Um, I was an environmental science major in college, but you can continue. <laughs> just there you go. Keep on going. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, listen. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead. So you got one more thing? No, I was just going to say that was the first time we uh, had drinks together and wasn't the last either. There you so go. it's pretty good. Awesome. Well, this is going to bring to a close our first ever podcast here. Sean, I'm so glad that we're finally getting this thing off the uh, off the ground. And uh, I mean, hopefully we'll have other people that will be coming in. And uh, for anybody who does listen to this uh, for our podcast for the first time around, you just know that one of the things that we're looking forward down the road is uh, to kind of open up this session right that the recording session actually uh to raging chicken press members so if you're interested in finding ways that you can help us out at raging chicken press you can go to ragingchickenpress.org right and click on a support membership button and kind of become a member or shoot us a little donation um also kind of a little bit of a a, a note you know any of you who go out there um and you shop on amazon i'm not condoning amazon whatsoever but if you already shop them just go to our page and kind of click on our Amazon link and shop through there because basically for everything that you buy through Amazon, we're going to get about, well, I don't know, about 6%, 6 or more. Uh, we kick back to us. Won't increase your cost at all, um, but it will help support the work that we do here. And visit our other kind of supporters and sponsors on the page too as well. I have to kind of do a shout out to Bluehost. Bluehost is our our um, our web hosting site. Um, and they've just, they've been, they've been fantastic What's um, right across the board. And in the notes for this show, I'm going to put a little um, I'll put a little link there because they have a special coming up. If anybody's looking to start up a web page, looking for a way to migrate over to a different server, uh, Bluehost will have a uh, is having a special coming up for three ninety five a month uh, for unlimited um, space on their servers um, to get yourself up and running. So that's uh, really kind of cool. And yes, if if you click on that Bluehost um, link that I'll kind of put in the notes here, um, and you do sign up with Bluehost, that we get a kickback here, at Raging Chicken Press. Um, for uh, everybody who signs up. And, you know, frankly, that's some of the ways that uh, we kind of keep everything going. We're able to kind of uh, upgrade our servers that we're able to kind of get the support that we needed um, and, you know, um, help buy some of the equipment that has helped made uh, Sean's, you know, uh, recording and Sean's stuff a little bit easier for him out there in Harrisburg. Um, I mean, that's all comes from you all uh, who are supporting progressive media here in Pennsylvania. So uh, we look forward to this kind of kicking off and see where we go. Um, Sean, thanks for, so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, watching this grow in the future. All right. You know, and we'll talk, absolutely. And we'll talk to you next week. This is uh, Raging Chicken Press Podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, and we're out.